What can you tell us right now about the activity that's happening in the auto market? Yeah, it's quite a story, Alex, and uh, I'll get right to the point. You know, January and February were extraordinarily strong. Then we had shelter in place, hit us starting in mid-March, where imagine 95% of the markets we operate had stay-at-home, shelter in place. Uh, so the strength of the quarter performance was uh, January and February, 91 cents versus not, only down 4% from the prior year. So business was cut in half with shelter in place. Uh, sales down 50%. Uh, we had to take action to protect the company to see us through the crisis. We had to furlough 7,000 associates, almost 30% uh, of the company. But we were deemed essential everywhere we operated. Uh, and if you think about it, we are. All the doctors and nurses, firemen, policemen, mm -hmm. if they had difficulty with their vehicle, it absolutely positively had to be fixed. I thank all the AutoNation employees for that. But then a drumbeat started uh, from customers. And, and here's what they said. Um, they want a safe environment within which to do business, and we have extensive protocols for this. But more so, they said they want personal space in mobility. They want their own personal car where they decide who's in it when, and they control the safety of that environment. So we see an automotive recovery that is underway, and sales have, have developed from 50% down to 20% down by the end of April going uh, into May. Um, so there's pent up demand, expectation from the customers for personal safety, financing is available mm -hmm. and cheap, contrary to the Great Recession, and we need the plants to restart. Uh, we're going to need more inventory than we have at the moment, so I fully support uh, the reopening of the plants. Even uh, Elon Musk should be allowed to reopen the Tesla plant in San Francisco. I don't understand how you can fly a plane packed like sardines from New York to San Francisco, but you can't open a plant with 30% of the workforce. So the plants need uh, to reopen. The automotive recovery is underway. So based on that, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up sort of inventory because I wondered uh, where the holes were. As the economic activity restarts, as your company sees better sales, where are your holes? So on the new vehicle side, it's no question it's pickup trucks, in particular the General Motors Silverado and GMC. Because if you think about it, they had the strike, which uh, reduced availability and then got hit with the corona shutdown. That is the vehicle which is in uh, the most demand relative to the supply we have. But as a matter of fact, pickup trucks uh, performed the best through this whole disruptive period, I think only down something like uh, 10%. So if they can restart the pickup truck plants first, uh, I'll be uh, standing here in line uh, saying, send me all you can get. But the point is uh, that America needs to gradually, safely, reopen and resume economic activity. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned you'd be the first one in line being like, give me all your trucks. Uh, how does that um, shortfall in supply and inventory affect pricing? So the, the customer uh, expectation for personal mobility uh, and safety is the number one priority. And if we don't have it new, we will uh, offer them something pre-owned and they're at the moment, uh, very flexible and uh, willing to change. And the availability in the pre-owned side overall is very good. But uh, you can't leave these plants closed when you have an, an automotive recovery that is underway. And there will be twists and turns and surprises yet in 2020, exactly how it all develops, uh, but, but certainly by 2021, it should be a very good year for automotive. Uh, talk to me about how you're uh, selling your cars. How much of that's being done online uh, versus on a, a showroom floor? How do you do it? What have, how have you tried to rejigger your business? So um, we were already making a strategic investment uh, in digital capability, and the customer uh, is there embracing it. And I would say, mm, let's say 35% of all our sales activity originated and was cared for digitally. 
That, in a matter of days, has accelerated to 45%. I think that wow. is an inflection point from which there is no turning back. And companies in the future that want to succeed are going to need this combination of digital capability and then a safe environment, whether you're interacting with the customer at home uh, or the customer chooses to come into your store. So we have all kinds of protocols around safety. We have our employees all wearing masks. We provide them a new mask every day. If your customer needs to mm -hmm. use a pen, we give them a brand new pen that's sealed. So we've thought of every protocol to make sure our customers and our associates are safe. So how does that change your workforce going forward? I mean, are you literally going to have to rent less space to sell cars? Do you change the type of workforce that you have? Walk me out like eight to 12 months. Yeah, so Alex, I, I really don't have an answer for you that, for that today. Um, I do think though, that as the recovery gets underway, that is the key question that has to be studied and determined if there's a different way to meet the needs of the customers uh, with a different approach and a different staffing plan. But quite frankly, that's not something I can answer today, but you're absolutely on the point. Which, and I appreciate your candor in that because I think it's something that everyone in the market is trying to figure out, especially in light of the jobs numbers on Friday, is that there's so many people, like 18 million people that are temporarily off of work but are just furloughed, and we're trying to get a read on how quickly they can come back or if they wind up coming back at all. This, this is absolutely the question. Now, now, think about this, Alex. There are fewer people employed in America today than there were at the bottom of the Great Recession in 08, 09. We've evaporated more jobs in a few days than it took 10 years uh, to rebuild, and, and we're at a worse point now. Uh, so mm -hmm. I really, there's so much uncertainty as far as what happens next uh, over the next few months that I can't, quite frankly, predict with any degree of certainty. Do and I think it's incumbent upon business to examine it every day and try to figure it out. And I promise you, you will. We will. And when we do, I'll be happy to discuss it uh, with you. I think that's what the second half of 2020 is going to be all about. And I'm quite optimistic about 2021. And well, then clearly you'll have to come back and tell me when you know. But in the meantime, um, when you're sifting through the <laughs> data course, then yeah. and getting real time updates, uh, what do you look at? So if you're going to try and make these decisions over the next six to eight months, what is the data that you're looking at to help you make that decision? Well, there's one thing that we as a company have no shortage of. It's uh, data. We, we have reams of it that we uh, generate every day and look at uh, every which way. And we have people who are uh, closely examining this. I, I, I think the point is, if for business, you need to be open-minded uh, to rethinking mm -hmm. everything. But I, I already told you, the holy grail is you need world-class digital capability, you need to provide a safe environment for your customers, and then you're gonna have to think about how do I structure my business to efficiently and effectively meet those first two needs. Uh, there's been a lot of talk also uh, on the politic front about higher corporate taxes. So sort of at some point undoing the tax cut that we got under President Trump to pay for all the stimulus. Are you incorporating that into your planning in any way? First, I have to give the government very high marks for meeting the challenge of this pandemic. I think the work that the Treasury uh, and the Federal Reserve has done and the remarkable relationship between Steve Mnuchin and Jay Powell uh, and, the, and the momentous decisions and comprehensive and competent decisions they've made under tremendous pressure in a short period of time is truly remarkable. And uh, there's no question that the financial system in America will be safe and healthy, which was not the case uh, in uh, 08 or 09. So um, I feel very good about the financial system. I think the big question mark is what happens on the employment side? So that feels like you don't know yet about corporate taxes. <laughs> you know, oh, corporate taxes. Well, in the grand scheme of things, 
uh, let's see, I think it's a $4 trillion um, deficit this year, um, something like that, and, and probably more on the way. I'm not sure corporate mm. taxes is uh, going to be uh, the answer on that at all. Uh, so that's definitely in the we will see. Um, we pay our fair share and we'll continue. As a to. lot. As a lot of, of we will see. And then my final <laughs> yes, question you to you, and I appreciate uh, and I appreciate you joining us uh, for today, Mike, is uh, a, a Cheryl Miller obviously took a leave of absence for health reasons. You took over in her leave of absence. You've been with the company uh, since 1999. Um, how long do you feel like you're going to be continuing in this particular role? And do you have any other plans ahead for yourself? Well, I would say this, uh, Alex. First, uh, we are all in a very different place than we thought we would be uh, two months ago, and that certainly uh, includes me. Cheryl had two asks. She, she asked for a medical leave, and she asked for privacy. The company has granted the medical leave, and I respect her privacy. 